Women in The Great Gatsby are rendered outsiders from the undercurrents of their depictions as sexual objects and caveats to men's success, displaying irony in that women must practice self-reliance whilst appearing an attractive prospect of wifely dependency. The construction of female characters in Gatsby are written as cliched women who embody their archetypes of the 20th century prose. Critics such as Marius Bewley, for instance, draw on Daisy's vicious emptiness or her monstrous moral indifference. These sentiments have been echoed by Robert Orstein and Alfred Kazin, who find her vulgar and inhuman. These negative perceptions of Daisy appear to hinge largely on the power she holds over Gatsby, which in effect only serves to diminish the complexity of the novel by ignoring the nuance of Daisy's character through the stark polarisation of good boy Gatsby and bad girl Daisy. Guided by only Nick's view, readers often have no apparent awareness that Daisy's silly mannerisms conceal a woman of feeling through subtle misgivings. The display of hurt when Daisy functions outside of Gatsby's projected paradigm demonstrates that Gatsby wants Daisy as merely the woman he builds up in his imagination rather than the reality of who she is. Even Nick admits that Daisy tumbled short of his dreams, not through her own fault, but because of the colossal vitality of his illusions. It had gone beyond her, beyond everything. Hence Daisy's failure is inevitable, as no woman or anyone could ever reach the platonic ideal Gatsby has invented. Daisy's corruption at the end is arguably not inherent to her, but the result of her treatment by others. Daisy's name, femininity, flowers and light. Fitzgerald's imagery has focuses on colour, which heightens a romanticised mood prevalent in the text, and alludes that women are the second sex through comparisons of Daisy's desirability to external determinants, using floral and light motifs to reveal the differences between men and women, with even the naming of Daisy to poignantly reveal the condemned conception of women in 1920. The connotative associations attached to Daisy's name splay out in widely divergent directions. 19th century Americans use Daisy as a superlative to describe something charming whilst idiomatic usage associates Daisy with death. Though Daisy doesn't choose her name, she has control over her fate, unlike James Gatz. Naming a character after a flower evokes certain characteristics and ideals, holding Daisy hostage by categorising her, creating a duality of language. It can be used to control or be purposely subversive to criticise its oppressive nature. Daisy automatically assigns qualities that are stereotypically feminine. Daisy constantly pushes boundaries with what societal expectations were for women at the time, but like many flapper women, the acceptable language Fitzgerald used was still very oppressive. Yet, Daisy decides to cause a scene right before her marriage, stating, tell him all Daisy's changed her mind. The imperatives suggest that she takes ownership within the domestic space. In Western literature, flowers are associated with the feminine, whereas light has connotations with religion. The persistent motif shows the dichotomy in which women's power is harnessed by men, and creates a paradox that allows Fitzgerald to use familiar symbols and metaphors, which he employs to explore how women are poised to break out at any time, but cannot because they are suppressed by the patriarchy, such as through the rosy-coloured porch. Roses are ubiquitously scattered throughout the novel, with Tom introducing with a sweeping bravado his rosy-coloured porch as an allusion to his cultivated ownership of thriving domesticated roses whose sole purpose, like women, namely Daisy and Myrtle, are to provide beauty for him to gaze upon. After Daisy kills Myrtle, Nick utters he found what a grotesque thing a rose is, which alludes that Gatsby realises the fabrication of his reality, and his dream will never come to fruition because of Daisy's grotesqueness recognising the dissolution of his perfect woman. The crimson room bloomed with light also creates a feminine atmosphere which Fitzgerald adds the word bloom to this domesticated space. Light in Gatsby's house, such as the patron saint of recurrent light, is metaphoric of Christ-like illusions. Nick as narrator. A persistent problem is Nick Carraway's reliability as a narrator. As a result, efforts in revising the current opinion of Daisy must begin with Nick, Daisy, in reality, is arguably more of a victim of circumstance than a victimizer. Nick maintains a distant, objectifying relationship with women. For instance, he characterizes Myrtle by her perceptible vitality, with the nerves of her body continually smouldering, reducing her worth to her sexuality. 
It is also suggested that Nick moves east in order to escape the consequences of his actions, as he supposedly leaves a tangle back home, jilting his engagement partner. He admits he liked to walk up Fifth Avenue and pick out romantic women from their crowd. Catsby vs Tom Daisy has her own story, her own desires and needs. Daisy tells Nick with a hint of insincerity, I'm paralysed with happiness. According to Leland Person, despite Nick's judgement of her carelessness and basic insincerity, a conspiratorial relationship with Tom, Daisy is victimised by a male tendency to project a self-satisfying yet ultimately dehumanising image on women. By choosing Tom, Daisy has allowed her life to be forever shaped by Tom's cruel power, his money. Nick hypothesised that Daisy wanted her life shaped now, immediately. On the other hand, she was subjected to Gatsby's increasingly depersonalised vision of her. The meaning of Gatsby's love had become an obsessive symbol of his American dream. He wished to monopolise her. The word monopolise connotes that Gatsby is not interested in Daisy as an individual, but her value. Gatsby desires the illusion of Daisy as a trophy rather than a woman. Veronica Mikowski asserts, Fitzgerald does not really develop female character beyond its utility as a handy narrative technique. Sarah Fryer has taken the perspective of a thorough influence of character construction, citing The Great Gatsby was written during a time of erosion of Fitzgerald's marriage to Zelda, may have decreased his sympathy for feminine conflicts. It is notable that Daisy, when receiving Gatsby's letter, is willing to throw away everything she has with Tom, disregarding the $350,000 string of pearls. Daisy was always drawn to the appeal of Gatsby, which is of much greater significance to her than Tom. Nick senses a similar romantic readiness in Daisy. Gatsby was as much of an ideal to Daisy as she was to him. Daisy says to Gatsby, I like to get one of those pink clouds and push you in it and push you around. Daisy chooses her words carefully. Under her silly demeanour, we see the real Daisy. She's unhappy. Under Gatsby's spell, she wishes desperately to escape. Just as Daisy fails to measure up to Gatsby's fantasy, Gatsby fails hers. And so, Daisy exists as Gatsby's female double, as both an anima and doppelganger, the failure of a mutual dream. At its core, the great Gatsby serves as an allegory depicting the death of a romantic vision of America. It is only as Daisy is forced into an ice cold bath with the letter crumbling like snow are Daisy's dreams frozen. Consequently, it is after this is she able to marry Tom without so much as a shiver. Her dreams, her romantic impulses are paralysed but still unhappy. Her awareness of this and Tom's corruption lead her to wish that her daughter will become a beautiful little fool because this is the best thing a girl can be in this world, unaware, a complete insider. Though sardonic, Daisy's longing to be more beautiful and foolish shows that she is complicit by conforming to the social standard of American femininity in the 1920s. However, Fitzgerald uses an exchange between Daisy and Tom, in which she asserts her opinion by labelling Tom as hulking, which he objects to, yet she controls the narrative by not removing it. Hulking, insisted Daisy. As the discrepancy between Daisy and Gatsby's illusion of her become clear, Gatsby's count of enchanted objects had diminished by one. Gatsby never comprehended or loved the real Daisy. She was always to him the king's daughter, the golden girl with an inexhaustible charm and a voice full of money. She was always an enchanted object for him to obtain, his green card into a secluded society. Her voice, a singing compulsion, a whispered listen, is full of promise in providing unrealised possibility. Men look to Daisy to transform the material world into a dreamland, a fantasy, where objects and Gatsby glow, bringing out this symbolic meaning that it had never had before and would never have again. Whilst Gatsby desperately tries to reconnect with Daisy, Daisy also seeks a lost moment from the past, but rejects his accumulation of extreme wealth in illegitimate ways. Ultimately, Daisy desires to return back to her girlhood, but Gatsby transforms himself into a nouveau riche version of Tom ironically forfeiting his ability to reclaim Daisy. He no longer looks at her the way every young girl wants to be looked at. Although she is temporarily liberated from Tom's world, she cries whilst visiting his mansion, offended by the vulgarity of his world. 
Daisy uncontrollably sobs, muffled in the thick folds, as Gatsby's obsessively constructed kingdom, founded on corruption, signals the disintegration and end to her dream. Tom reveals that the real Gatsby, not Daisy's illusion, is a common swindler, which disillusions Daisy for the second time. As the truth sinks in, Daisy withdraws herself further and further, until they are inevitably split apart forever. Consequently, she ends up choosing to move back towards Tom's world of unquestionable practicality, destroying any possibility of illusion or alternative as she runs over Myrtle, easing her re-entry into Tom's life. The act of killing her husband's mistress, according to Person, also climaxes the symbolic process by which she herself has been reduced from archetype to stereotype. At the moment of impact, the final crash of a dead dream into the disillusioning body of reality, it is surely no accident in a novel of mutual alienation that Daisy and Gatsby are both gripping the steering wheel. Daisy loses her nerve to hit the other car and commit a double suicide. Instead, she chooses life and the seemingly inevitable workings of history. She forces the story to be played out to its logical conclusion, Gatsby's purgative death and her own estrangement from love. Daisy is an outsider because they are presented as subservient to the development of the male narrative, whilst an assortment of critics claim that the adjectives such as eerie to describe Daisy and aggressive to classify Tom create traditional characterisation of gender stereotypes. A myriad postulate that Fitzgerald uses rhetorical spaces that are typically attributed to being feminine or domestic to expose the anti-hegemonic construction. While on the surface, The Great Gatsby appears to reinforce patriarchal messages that asseverate women as outsiders, Patricia Bizzle insists that a rereading, which combines gender with narratology, will allow readers to understand that the female characters were empowered and written to provide criticisms and resistance to women being viewed in such regard.